Welcome to the Entrepreneurship Webinar Series organized by the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation in association with I am Calcutta Innovation Park and Entrepreneurship Cell, I am Calcutta. I heartily welcome the dignitaries, Board of Governors, faculty, alumni, students, and fraternity of I am Calcutta. We bring before you a thinker, a visionary, Mr. V. Shankar, the founder, CEO of Computer Age Management Services, popularly known as CAMPS. The session is divided into two parts. The initial 30 to 35 minutes will be a discussion between the director of IM Calcutta and Mr. V. Shankar, post which there'll be a Q&A for 10 to 15 minutes. All the participants are requested to stay mute, muted at least until the discussion part. Please type in your queries in the chat box, which will be, which will be answered during the Q&A. I now welcome Professor Anju Seth, the director of IM Calcutta, to introduce the speaker and take the discussion forward. Good morning to our audience. Thank you for joining us in whichever part of the world you're coming from. So this could be good evening, this could be good afternoon, and we're delighted to have you here. Thank you for your introduction, Nikhil. I'm so delighted that this year we have kicked off a number of initiatives to strengthen the IIM Calcutta e entrepreneurship ecosystem and um, engaging in numerous new initiatives that involve the student club, which is ESEL, um, IIM Calcutta Innovation Park, and Shrikan Shastri, who's the head of our board of directors for IMCIP, I can see on the screen with us here. Um, also, our Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, uh, which has been, uh, which is headed at present by Professor Balram Avitathur. Thank you all so much for helping in creating this wonderful, exciting ecosystem that we will be delighted to take forward in, and we encourage everyone's participation in this as we move forward. Uh, today, we are also very pleased to have with us Mr. B. Shankar, one of our illustrious alum, alums who is, as Nikhil pointed out, the founder of CAMS. Oh, this is the second in our webinar series of uh, in, um, in the call, which we call IIM Create. We want to set up this YouTube channel. In fact, we have set up this YouTube channel to inform, to educate, and to share the accomplishments of our entrepreneurs. Um, the first speaker in this was, was Mr. Patuke Swani, the founder of Lemon Tree. And today we have Shankar with us, who's a great friend, as is Patu, great friend to the Institute. Um, Shankar is a graduate of IIT Madras and a alum of IIM Calcutta from the 1983 batch. He only had a brief stint working for an MNC. And very early on after that joined Computer Age Management Services Private Limited, and he ran it till he exited a short while ago. And congratulations, Shankar, on a wonderful and very successful IPO. It was very much in the news and we were all watching it, uh, uh, the success of it and celebrating its success. Thank so you very Cams much. is the largest company of its, in its space in India and is a concept that I'm pleased to see that, that Shankar invented. Um, it has a market share of 68% and is also one of the largest of its kind in, in the world. It's become a professionally managed public listed, publicly listed entity. <laughs> I can tell you personally speaking, while I was still in the US, I became very familiar with CAMS because it was the only way I could figure out what was happening to any of my mutual fund investments in India. So thank you, Shankar, for helping out <laughs> folks like me who don't know what's going on directly if you're talking to the mutual fund. Right. Um, Shankar's current activities involve both public and uh, angel investing, and as well as mentoring for startups and mature organizations. He's a member of our IIM Calcutta Innovation Park Board as well. And in that role, he gives enormously valuable advice to the, uh, the ventures that we incubate and provide assistance to. Shankar is also a Rotarian, a past present, a president of TIE Chennai and a member of the Chennai Angels and, the, and of the Institute of Engineers. I've already mentioned the various board memberships he's on. Thank you, Shankar, for joining us today and thank you for all that you do to help 
IIM Calcutta in various different ways. Over to you now. So I will start, I will gonna have ask, uh, address a number of questions. This is going to be a fairly free flowing discussion. And I, um, I think Nikhil already mentioned, please do share your questions in the chat window. We will get to them after this discussion, but um, we keep them coming along as we go on. So Shankar, our first question for you. When did you decide that you wanted to start your own company and why did you decide to do that? And this is in 1983 or close shortly there. Over to you. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Director. Thank you for having me on this. Uh, you know, as uh, most of us here are either alumni or students or stakeholders of some sort, I think before I say anything about myself, I must first compliment the Institute. We have, we are very proud of the fact that we enjoy the status of uh, Triple Crown accreditation by the three major bodies in the three continents and have done so, I think, for a few years now. More recently, we have been ranked second in the FT Asia rankings in uh, executive education. And uh, these uh, honors uh, only go to show the, the depth and the commitment of uh, the, the faculty, the leadership team, the board of governors, and you, Director Anju. Of course, uh, I think the alumni have a small role to play in it. And in, in that, many of the alumni are uh, quite successful in their careers. And uh, surely, a large part of their success must uh, rest in the roots of their IMC education. So thank you for that, uh, doctor. For bringing us to something here, Shankar. Can yeah. I just add to that? Being an alum of IM Calcutta myself, as you know, I completely echo the thoughts that much of what we have done in our lives we owe to the mothership IM Calcutta. Thank you so much for pointing that out. <laughs> yeah. So what I will do is I'd like to share a, a, a small presentation, and uh, uh, the way I will go about it is that uh, the presentation is really just pointers. Uh, uh, they're bullet points to keep me on course, uh, firstly, and uh, uh, to set the tone for each uh, question that you ask me. Now, you asked me when and why I decided to sort of roll up my sleeves and get down to entrepreneurship is a more recent uh, word. In, in those days, it was like it was called setting out on your own or, or going on your own or some such thing, a slightly pejorative term in those days. So as as I you know as I mentioned I was working for Ponds uh, along with Shrikant and a few others few other alums from IMC. The first few years when Ponds was Ponds a standalone company were perhaps the best years of my life, uh, best years of my professional life, barring of course uh, the, the the company that I founded. The company had a great management style of of uh, hiring good guys, giving them the space, and basically letting them do what they want as though they were entrepreneurs. We didn't know the word then, but uh, in, in hindsight, that was what they were doing. And it was a wonderful time, Srikanth Lekoit. A lot of us, we have a Pond's WhatsApp group and we reminisce amongst ourselves the good old days. But then as always happens, small, excellent companies get gobbled up. And this one got gobbled up too. And when you are in the belly of a big MNC, things are a little different than they used to be. And, uh, you know, it didn't sit well with me that, uh, that there were a whole lot of... Uh, processes and uh, guidelines to adhere to and uh, strict role definitions and so on, which undoubtedly are very good for a large mature company. But for me personally, it didn't do much at all. So I guess part one of my motivation was that uh, I was chafing. I really wanted to be my own boss. It doesn't matter if I was a big fish in a small pond. You know, the pond could go bigger, the pond could go smaller. The important thing was that you had to be your own master, you had to be the big fish. That was a driving motivation for me. So that was part one. Part two was that uh, in the 80s, the early 80s were around the time, or mid 80s were around the time when PCs and affordable computing started coming to the world and certainly to India. And uh, my company, Pons, where I was working at the time, uh, brought in a couple of computers, a couple of PCs. And, uh, you know, they were alien uh, pieces of equipment. Most of the people working there, slightly older. Uh, were not uh, very familiar, nor were they keen to become familiar with the equipment. And so it sort of fell on me to explore this strange device and see what could be done of it. 
and i did do that i explored it for a while and i found myself getting more and more fascinated with it and uh, slowly it dawned on me that perhaps this this technology was going to change the world as we knew it you know and uh, as a sales manager in ponds those days i used to have uh, what were called daily sales summaries and town sales summaries and so on which were large ledgers uh, a1 ledgers uh, running back uh, one for each month running back for i don't know 4 5 years so you had a big almira where hundreds of these ledgers were there if you wanted to know what happened last year this time you go dig out the right ledger turn it to the right page and you see what happens and uh, it was clear that computerization was going to radically change all of that and i did feel that perhaps somewhere i had an affinity for and an interest in in the larger space of uh, computing and so i guess the two put together sort of uh, drove me towards uh, finding uh, uh, something to do of my own in a space that i was by that time quite passionate about so i was quite passionate about using computers for the good of business and i was chafing at the bits at uh, at not being allowed to do what i want so i guess that's the quick uh, answer to your question i will start uh, by uh, sort of quoting by making this amended quote i will say uh, see we 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 often speak about great people doing great things and so on but i think the real history is written by quite ordinary people who do ordinary things but they do it in such a cohesive collective mission driven manner that they end up achieving extraordinary results it is not uh, strange that great people achieve great things and uh, it is to be celebrated but certainly it is uh, far more meritorious that ordinary people doing ordinary things end up collectively achieving extraordinary results and i do believe that uh, our company was basically comprised of ordinary people doing if you look at it in in small bits they were all small ordinary things that we did but we did them together in the spirit of mission in the spirit of commitment that ended up achieving extraordinary results and i will go on to explain this in the rest of my presentation i just want to call it as the power of mission because uh, i think srikant said this very well in yesterday's presentation very very made a very good presentation he said that india always works well in mission mode when when there is a crisis the country gets together the leadership the political leadership the administrative leadership gets together and makes thing happen but the ordinary day to day things like getting your traffic right getting your legal compliance right we do it very badly and i think the the key to uh, what we did was that we kept this mission uh, mentality going for quite some time till it became part of the dna i already spoke about this uh, i think we are very proud we are very each one of us is very proud of the fact that we are a product of iimc of course i am also proud of the fact that i am from iit madras i am sure most of us are proud of our undergraduate as well uh, but iimc opened our eyes iit at the end of the day was a was a sort of vertical technical education iimc opened our eyes to the rest of the world to the rest of the aspects of being in business of being in a commercial world and for that i will ever be grateful to iimc so what prompted me to start up was your question i explained a bit of the background see in the late 80s when when i actually started up actually starting up was not even a thing it was sort of uh, considered that uh, because you did not get a good opportunity working for a good multinational or government or whatever by default you had no choice but to fall back on doing something of your own and as i said it was a very banal consideration i was just pissed off i wanted to be my own master i wanted to do something be it small big whatever it is and i was very uh, very keen on doing something in the area of technology when i jumped in you know the, today's startup ecosystem is uh, is very complete it's very uh, supportive you have mentors you have uh, incubators we are we ourselves have an incubator we have people who are willing to fund you and then advise you there's a whole ecosystem that supports people who start up it was not so in those days when i jumped in i i, I didn't really understand the implications of, uh, of of what i was getting into there were clearly financial implications there was a salary which stopped coming instead it became a negative salary in terms of having to meet uh, month to month expenses there were social considerations i had uh, peers from my same batch from batches junior to me who had good uh, positions who had a great life with club memberships and so on working in large companies obviously i could not keep up with them and uh, as always on the professional side there was a lack of funding there was a lack of mentoring there was a lack of people who understood your motivation and said you know you're doing good thing don't worry you will succeed there was a lack of people to do that 
only asset perhaps i had was just great confidence that information technology was the future and i would somehow make it all work out so that was where i was and uh, those early days were very uh, very tough it took us almost 3 4 years to come to a stage where uh, our uh, revenues were consistent and they met our expenses uh, quite a few times we had to uh, you know cut back on salaries and things like that there was no concept of external capital we had capital and and if we made money we had that money to play around with so it was imperative that uh, every contract we took had to be profitable there was no scope for uh, taking business in the hope that it would lead to more business and more business the way it is done now and we took anything that came along though of course we wanted to be in the area of technology uh, you know people would come to us and say you have a computer you have a printer why don't you type this letter for me it looks better on your printer than it does on a typewriter and we did that because that was a source of revenue and we needed that to keep the home fires burning we struggled through various yes that was a wonderful introduction all of us who who know shankar know that he is very 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 modest and i think one of the things that he is not saying but i'm going to say on his behalf was is he was a true visionary to not just be passionate about an opportunity but even before that to recognize it that curiosity and that passion somehow combined together in a very serendipitous manner to create this you know this this company that has created uh, that has led to so much value for india the employment is created the wealth is generated so i'm so sh- hats off to you shankar for doing all of that but you, you were talking a little you were talking about your um the early days and the importance of cash flows even before you had positive cash flows was there some marker that had you convinced that this is the right idea irrespective of the doubts and the question marks so did you know that from the very get go were you just saying that well, we're going to make this happen or was there uncertainty and how did you deal with that uncertainty so oh, good question uh, uh, you know people think that you set out with a business plan and everything fall, falls in place and so on and so forth it was not so at all i knew that i was generally keen to do something in the area of technology we tried a lot of things many of them did work or they they worked uh, in the sense that they they kept our home fires burning but i was not able to scale them i was not able to scale them to a level that was interesting to me and you use the right word serendipity and in fact coincidentally i used the same word in a subsequent slide that uh, down the road uh, two things happened first is that uh, we realized uh, through through the efforts of good friends through the advice of good friends that the financial business the financial industry is really where technology is valued and where uh, uh, in fact it, it becomes a competitive advantage for many financial firms to have the most recent technology deployed and so we turned our eyes to the financial industry it was uh, difficult because the financial industry was based out of mumbai and we were out of chennai uh, just making a call was horrendously expensive leave aside the cost of you know flying down to mumbai and so on but it had to be done and uh, a couple of things in our favor one is that uh, clearly i mean uh, i must say that uh, our initial team was very uh, articulate was very uh, technology uh, friendly so to speak to the city banks of the world and speak to you know people of that caliber uh, visa we our peers who are competing with us we clearly came out as you know people with an iim background iit background so on so forth didn't really get into businesses like this they got into if at all they got into business they would get into a, a far more sophisticated and uh, higher profile business this was really a very uh, very ordinary uh, almost janitorial in its scope in the sense that you look after back office and papers and so on and so forth so for people like us to be in this business was itself uh, uh, extraordinary for our customer base and so they felt uh, they were like us in other words our customers turned out to be like us and and not so much like our peers and so there was an instant empathy with uh, many of the uh, financial uh, large financial businesses they related to us we related to them and so we were able to achieve a certain connect and a certain glue with the financial sector that uh, somehow transcended the fact that we were sitting in chennai uh, it was difficult to make phone calls etc all the rest of it that i said but they still stuck with us because they believed in us 
what did i learn in that uh, sorry anju please ask what you wanted to ask i, I just um, I, I i'm sorry i interrupted your train of thought here shankar but you the, the point that you just made that you were on the same page in the same wavelength as your customers also has to me a very pointed message you were solving a real need i i visualize the ledgers that you're talking about at i am calcutta we have many of these ledgers still in existence <laughs> so i don't have to visualize very long but that whole notion of a, a, an a financial services industry for whom record keeping is so absolutely critical and you're developing a solution to an important need you understand it they understand it and you're obviously meeting in the middle to be all that problem so i think that is what came across to me that you is no it's it's that back office operation may not be sexy but it is so critical to success you're absolutely right you're absolutely right and uh, a couple of the learnings that we got from our startup phase i don't know if those learnings are relevant anymore in this capital flush world but uh, in our capital scarce world we had to manage so I, cash flow was very important for me because the cash flow uh, there was no point taking business if the cash was not coming in in a reasonable amount of time it's better to just give up the business uh, because the business would have variable costs which you would not be able to fund and costs had to be managed tightly whether it was a rent whether it was uh, sharing a phone amongst five people we had no choice but to manage costs very tightly as i said client relationships being distant we had one strike against us already on account of location we had to over deliver related to relative to both our sls and our competition we had to over deliver to to give them the comfort that we are far away but yet dependable chanku what was the competition at that time oh we had a number of competitors we had a, we had i think a total of uh, 100 and odd companies in this business at that point in time all on the sub scale all of them were sub scale we all had you know 30 40 50 employees and uh, we were all going after small businesses in our geography and uh, they were all uh, sort of lifestyle businesses as we call them today mom and pop shops some guy sets up a business all he wants is his salary equal to be replaced that's it not not very really, very ambitious not looking for scale so i think so in a sense yeah sorry. that's the idea but that's also part of your vision that is yeah. so important to you and your team working together it's not just about for solving a problem an important problem but also solving it at such scale and yeah. i would like everyone to remember that with that competitive base this company is now has six some 60 70% market share in a very tough environment so it could mm. be so how yeah i'm again i'm i'm kind of interrupting you shankar but i also want to hear something we all want to hear something about that team that you worked with so I, i before saying before talking about that i just want to talk about uh, the serendipity angle that you mentioned so we were uh, you know till about 1995 we were we had to eat what we hunted so we had to constantly go after assignments and each assignment would last perhaps 3 months 4 months 6 months and and we had to have a pipeline of us it was like a construction industry the next big construction job would pay your bills and you needed to have the pipeline and so on it was taking a toll on us uh sometimes we had dry spells we had to lay off people we had to hire people again we were constantly wondering how to get some element of annuity into our business so there would be some base level of constant cash flow which would at least meet our basic fixed costs and then the rest of it you know we are willing with we are willing to handle variable in that uh, situation uh, in 1995 regulations were created to to support the launch of what we call as open ended that's the top, sort of mutual fund we are familiar with today an open ended mutual fund is one where you can buy any day and you can sell any day prior to that mutual funds could only be launched by state bodies which is banks and so on and they had to be close they had to mimic equities you had to buy and then you had to just hold it for 7 years 8 years 10 years whatever was the tenor of the fund and get back whatever it was at the end of that period not a very successful product at that point in time most of us the, the 100 odd competitors we looked at that and said okay yet another financial product we'll go do our bit you know bidding for them etc etc fortunately and this is that serendipity strikes the first couple of clients that we had were american firms who were setting up business in india for the first time and they were very keen that they would bring their american business practices to india to an environment which was far away from what it was in the us and uh, it did not immediately strike us but 6 months a year down the road 
it started striking us that this was potentially a vast opportunity that was opening up to us where we actually could redefine our role now a quick tutorial on how this product works in western markets now it works in india as well but at that time worked in western metro markets the customer proposition for most mutual funds is actually more about uh, support service advice than about raw returns because returns are not sustainable no fund manager will give you will be number one for five years in a row seven years in a row but the overall support that he gives you in terms of explaining how things are the advice that he gives you the customer service that is provided that entire basket could keep him at the number one position through dry spells through spells of slightly bad performance that was a learning that we had from longer markets in abroad the distribution model very very uh, interesting the distribution model for mutual funds mimics exactly the fmcg model and so for me coming from a ponds where we were selling fast moving consumer goods soaps toothpaste uh, powder the distribution model potentially could be just lifted from there in fact i i went to a couple of my friends working in levers at that time and asked them for uh, suggestions asked them to be on a board of mine to help me conceptualize a distribution model the entire customer life cycle engagement model that i talked about earlier the various industry stakeholders and their roles that is the management company the fund managers the distributors the people who perform various back office roles the bankers they all had a role and they all had a share of the pie that was the revenue out of this whole operation since this industry was being created for the first time really it boiled down to uh, the wild west and uh, in this pie whatever you could stake your claim was what you might end up getting and uh, having understood that and with the encouragement of our clients we went and staked out a role for ourselves that went far beyond what a traditional back office role would have been and i think that was uh, the good luck good fortune that we had that we managed to stake out a much greater share of the pie of this industry than is traditional for people performing this role in other markets Let's stop you for a minute and uh, anju give you an opportunity yeah. to ask questions i'm going to push you on that one mm -hmm. there is serendipity but again there's opportunity recognition yes. and you saw this opportunity you made it happen it was it did you could have left it lying on the table and somebody else could have grabbed that opportunity so i do want to emphasize that you did something very specific and then the what was the role of these uh, these your partners the ones that you talked about these american companies so uh, the I'm first sharing what is the model yeah go ahead so actually they were very kind to us they they were quite free and open with their uh, home markets they they invited us they took us through their entire operation they introduced us to their partners in those countries and uh, they explained to us their vision for the business in india they said see this is how we run our business in the us and we'd like to come as close to it as possible in india in terms of transparency in terms of uh, client service standards in terms of turnaround times in terms of every aspect we want to get as close to it as is possible given the infrastructural constraints and cost constraints in india and so we aspire to do that today so i must say that the first few clients of ours are true partners in in building us to where we are excellent and then uh, at these aspirations of world class models that you can make available to everyone at a relatively low cost but we'll go to that uh, a little bit later are you ready now to talk about your team yes yes so you see as you correctly pointed out it was not a sexy business at the core it was still a processing business but overlaid but with using a lot of technology using a lot of ip but at the end of it it was not a sexy business and we did find that hiring people from uh, lateral large organizations didn't work because they came to us with a certain expectation of uh, of uh, a sexiness of uh, you know of the even the physical working environment was not what they were used to you you could come from an mnc or you could come from a bank and then you would find this office to be quite uh, crappy all said in that because that's all we could afford so we decided that our overall hr strategy would be to take people who are not yet fit for a role but groom them into a role so that remained our strategy for maybe 20 years after that 
So we used to take people from relatively small towns. It didn't bother us that they couldn't speak English very well. All that didn't bother us. The important thing was that they would uh, uh, they would uh, accept instruction properly. They would learn and they would follow a process. And most of all, they would be grateful for the opportunity that they got. If you're coming from a relatively small village into Chennai and you get to work in a proper organization and not in one uh, you know lala shop which at least has you know a table and a chair and a computer and some air conditioning it's a great step up for them and uh, our company was to some extent being recognized uh, in the market our clients were of good quality they were willing to speak to these people as equals or as semi equals notwithstanding the fact they didn't understand the language etc all that was a very big uh, uh, incentive for people to work with us so much so that uh, you know our compensations were always uh, uh, you know certainly not amongst the top they were certainly in the second quartile perhaps in the third quartile but we kept challenging our employees so much to do things that were you know thought to be impossible and we kept pushing them we said you know you got to figure out a way to do this and our clients kept challenging them so much so that actually the the the, the challenge of executing an impossible project became really the dna of the company that kept people glued to us they were always hooked on the next challenge that would come to us so i will say that our team by and large comprised of perfectly ordinary people who were doing perfectly forgettable jobs in their past life and then they joined us and suddenly they were elevated to very challenging exciting jobs uh, with uh, clients who are name brands even if we were not a name brand the clients were name brands and uh, they would get the opportunity to speak to them once in a while and uh, there was good technology even if the rest of the environment was crappy the technology was top notch we had great computers we had the best that money could buy and uh, uh, they were challenged every day they came to work so that was the model that we had to employ per force to develop a team Excellent. at least in the early years but very people who were hungry and employee based that exactly. was hungry and exactly. passionate in that hunger too but you must have faced times of adversity and doubt yes we did yes How we did Deal with those. Describe a time. How did you deal with any of those? We had uh, we had several crises. Some of them were uh, were uh, almost near fatal in their scope. Uh, some of them were good crises in the sense that uh, uh, you would suddenly get a project which was far larger than our capability to handle. But somehow we'll do the jugad and you know somehow uh, make it in time. Maybe it was there were more errors etc. But somehow we'd manage the situation. Those were the good uh, crises. the bad crisis were when uh, you see the role that we started taking in the life of these mutual funds and as these mutual funds became more retail in their scope so we had uh, we started with perhaps 50000 customers all india then we went to 500000 then we went to 5 million today we probably have 50 million customers on our books all over india so as the people whose life we could impact and you know when i talk about our role we were the single point of record keeping at the very elemental level we were at the single point of record keeping for this entire customer base so if i owned 100000 rupees worth of mutual funds or somebody else owned another 100000 rupees of mutual funds the only point where this record was kept was in our office and so people started looking at us at a single point of failure regulator started waking up and saying you know you are privately owned you are pretty much owned by one guy and how did you even get to this stage you this is a sovereign role the the function that you're performing is effectively a sovereign function uh, uh, national stock exchange performs this role a depository performs this role how can you possibly have an individual owned business starting to perform this role at scale it's a very scary feeling so there were many initiatives to sort of nationalize us to say that uh, uh, this sort of ownership doesn't work either you delicense the business and then acquire it in some other form or whatever we went through a very tough period for almost 3 years uh, fortunately we had a board we had a board which was very supportive we had an advisory board comprised of really influential and uh, really uh, good people who who had our back all the time we fought a very tough battle and we survived greatly weakened at the end of it i must say that all the silver bullets that i had accumulated in 20 years of my life were all expended at one stroke just trying to get over this crisis and came out bankrupt at the end of it if not financially certainly in terms of all my relationships had been exploited to the fullest and all my silver silver bullets had been expended by the time we came out of this whole challenge so i'll stop here for a moment and this is just one there were number of other crises of this type 
including people leaving us, you know, key people leaving us, all like all organizations have been through all of them. But this is singular in its impact and its uh, sort of almost catastrophic effect on us. That is a serious crisis. And it's hard to see the opportunity in that crisis. Many yeah. crises have opportunities, but that just sounds like a crisis that has <laughs> one way and that is down into an abyss. Yes. And so we're delighted that that was, was, uh, was postponed. Um, I know we, have, we can go on forever in this line of discussion, but I do know that we have quest other questions to try to understand about the IPO process. So if you can spend a few minutes telling us, how did you get from near bankruptcy to a very, very successful IPO? Yeah, I look back and wonder myself sometimes. Uh, I think I, I want to preface the answer with this slide, which you see on screen, hmm. which is that I, I use the word extraordinary things, uh, a group of ordinary people doing ordinary things to achieve extraordinary outcomes. And why do I use the word extraordinary? If I look back, and it was all not apparent at the time, but in hindsight, located in Chennai, it was straight away one strike against us vis-a-vis -vis the financial market. They were all in Bombay. They had a, a, a very close network. And just getting into that network was a big challenge, which somehow, as I explained earlier, we managed to break in. Second is, increasingly, as we scaled, we started carrying out what was perceived as a sovereign function, which is that sovereign entities, be it a stock exchange, be it a large, well-capitalized bank like State Bank of India, those were the entities who were qualified somehow uh, from a risk perspective, from a scale perspective, to carry out this job and certainly not uh, thinly capitalized uh, entities such as us. And as I said, attempts were made to modify regulation to make to, to take us out of the business, et cetera, et cetera, which we somehow got out of, which I will explain in a minute. The business was capitalized to just one lakh of rupees in 1988. That's it. There has never been any additional primary capital into the business. And uh, we are what we are because we reinvested every pie of what we earned in the last 30 years. Now, how did we get from a, 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 a position of extraordinary crisis, beaten down situation to where we are now? I think at the end of that crisis, when people saw that we were still standing, they somehow realized that perhaps they are not such bad guys after all. And perhaps it is worth supporting them. It helped a lot that through a secondary transaction, the National Stock Exchange became a shareholder of our company at that time. So between ownership by HDFC Group and National Stock Exchange, there was a patina of credibility that became associated with that company. So it was no longer about the small startup which is doing you know, the sovereign functions and so on. It is like, okay, now you deserve to be doing the sovereign functions because you are held widely and you are held by large entities of repute and so on and so forth. And uh, it was clear to us that uh, any form of private holding, if you look at any of these regulated entities, you will find that shareholding is mandated to be widely dispersed. That is the way it is. They give you a certain amount of leeway, but uh, you cannot forever be privately owned. Uh, it is a risk mitigating, a mitigating factor. So over a period of time, it became clear that we had to have a diversified shareholding. And so it became imperative that we get into IPO mode at some point in time or the other. After that, it was only a question of when, the timing being right, our books being, you know, well organized, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one last quick question before we turn it over to the audience questions, and that is, what advice would you give to budding entrepreneurs that are in the audience, and we hope who will view the webinar that we will put up on our website? So this is a question I get asked all the time, and. Uh, I, I want to break up my answer into two parts, uh, covering the early part of a startup and then the growth or scaling part of a startup. Actually, I'm more qualified to talk about the scaling part because the latter part of my life has been in scaling. But I will, uh, since I'm involved with a great many startups now as an angel investor, I will try to talk about that as well. The, it is always better to have two founders. That is something that we have found. At least I'd be sitting on the other side of the table as investors. We always find that it's better to have uh, at least two founders, not more than three perhaps, because uh, there is a certain risk perception attached with one uh, founder. And secondly, two heads are always better than one. The scope of uh, 
the, the, the amount of work that you have to put into the early stages of startup is so large that it is really burdensome for one person to really try to carry that burden all by yourself. Uh, so it is typical and it is uh, it's a good thing for even if you are a single founder with an idea, I would recommend that you should search around and try to find somebody who will carry the burden along with you. And uh, don't make him a junior partner. Try to make him as equal as you can yourself. That's the first advice I have to small startups. Somebody who is truly simpatico with you. That's right. That's exactly right. And uh, it, sometimes it's difficult to find people like that, but it's better to wait and do it rather than. The second thing that I would suggest is that uh, starting up a business must come out of passion and not out of uh, uh, either uh, uh, either uh, following the fashion or uh, because you think you're going to make a lot of money. It may end up that you may make a lot of money. It may end up that you may pay, make more money, no money at all. We don't know. But I think the primary motivation to start something up is to follow a passion and to believe that you can change the world in, in, in whatever small way that you can. You all believe that you can change the world by pursuing a particular path and that the rewards will follow automatically. You, you're not pursuing a reward, you're pursuing a goal, you're pursuing a passion and the world rewards you for it. That I think is the right model for starting up. Quite often I find it uh, the other way around. So that is why I take pains to point this out. So on the early stage, uh, I have spoken of a couple of points and I think there is a large ecosystem which will advise uh, uh, startups as in their early stages. And I guess the third advice I have is that you must take advantage of this ecosystem. Do not try to do it alone. There are enough and more people willing to help. Please take advantage of that. But I do want to talk about uh, the next stage of growth. Once you get funded, once your business is sort of on a, at least on a reasonable footing, and now you're looking at scaling, you have to bring in laterals. You have to bring in, bring in people at management level. And while doing so, I think the cultural and professional fitment is very important. Uh, sometimes we, uh, in my case, for example, uh, many of the colleagues that I brought in at, at senior management level down the road, were all people who I had worked with in Ponds. And uh, fortunately, Ponds was happy hunting grounds because uh, the company had changed. And like me, a lot of people were uh, not necessarily very thrilled at what was happening. So they were happy to leave and come back to a, a sort of simulated Ponds to the extent that we had uh, at least 10 of my erstwhile colleagues working in my company at one point in time. So, and, and we got on very well together because we had worked together. Many of us were in college together as well. And so it was a great thing. Not everybody will be as fortunate, but the point is that cultural and professional fitment is very important. The second thing is that as you bring in people, it's important to vacate the space that you had occupied. It's not possible to get a senior person and try to look over his shoulder. It just doesn't work. You have to accept and acknowledge that people work differently. It's the outcomes that are important. The style is important, but the style can vary and you cannot micromanage the style. You have to give them the space and let them deliver in the manner that they are comfortable with. And if you don't do that, then that's a sure recipe for disaster at some point in time or the other. What is the role of the founder as you go along? As you go along and as you get a, a, a full-fledged operating team, which has sort of occupied all the executive space that you used to occupy. The role of the founder, I think, has to become the guardian of the culture and DNA of the company. I think that is the one thing that stems from the founder or the founding team. Mm -hmm. And as laterals come in, as the organization scales, that is the one item which is greatest at risk. And so it is imperative that as the founder, you have to put in processes, you have to be the exemplar of that culture and DNA and make sure it perpetuates, uh, that it is there in perpetuity, not diluted by other people coming in. You know, I have found that people rarely work for companies, right? There are, you know, a few companies where people work for companies. Uh, you can count them on your fingers, but people always work for people. If you have a good boss who appreciates you and, uh, you know, the money doesn't matter. The money will happen sometime in life or the other. But if you have a good boss, if you have a good working environment, if you're challenged at work, then that is all that is, that matters. Hick off a lot more than any amount of, you know, compensation that you will get, assuming that it isn't reasonable. So these are some of the lessons that I've learned. I think that, uh, uh, so as a founder, as a member of the founding team, these are some of the things that you have to take care of as you scale the company. So I will sort of close at this point and, and leave it to you and you to ask the questions. Thank you so much, Shankar. That was amazing. Nikhil, can you say, would you like to take over the questions? Sure, ma'am, if you... Yeah. Is that yeah. fine? Yeah. Right. So one of the biggest challenges in a financial institution is ensuring integrity and retaining credibility among customers. How did you ensure this integrity 
in an industry which is new in india that's a that's an outstanding question in fact indeed that was our biggest challenge and even more so and i will give an example of advertising if an advertising agency is uh, is uh, advertising a product for a company then very rarely will it get the opportunity to advise uh, to advise uh, work with its competitor so somebody who is doing close up will never be able to work with colgate uh, at best you can start a subsidiary at arms length and so on but uh, there is a very clear not a chinese wall a physical wall we as not just service providers but representatives and the face of our client actually got to work with competitors who are going hammer and tongs in the marketplace at each other it's like working with coke and pepsi at the same time it was clear to us that no amount of explanations is going to solve this only proof of the pudding is in the eating from the that this is what i said the culture and the dna is very important from the very first day it was crystal clear to all our employees and to us that this business of customer confidentiality integrity of process was perhaps the one single most important criterion that would determine our success or failure and so people tried a lot people tried bribing our employees to get information out and so on sometimes it was for real sometimes it was a sting operation fortunately as i said people were so committed to the vision and people understood totally why we were doing what we were doing that i don't know if it is uh, there's a certain element of luck also involved in this there were not that many bad apples i guess and they also said that our, our people strategy revolved around taking really middle class people and putting them in good positions so they had a sense of gratitude to the company for bringing them where they are they felt loyal to the company they would never uh, sort of uh, uh, betray us by doing anything that was out of the ordinary so the, it's a combination of things but you are right the questioner is right in that that is one of the most important attributes of a financial thank god by god's grace we have been there till now i have a small nice supplementary question to that uh, yes prime uh, so uh, so was this ensured by uh, documentation or was it left to the uh, interpretation by the employees no no it was uh, it was assured by a number of physical checks as well uh, the standard it checks the standard chinese walls around in fact in some cases physical walls around groups of people doing work for different clients all those things are in place but uh, you know at the end of the day where there is a will there is a way if if an employee wants to do something uh, they will find a way to do something so ultimately you had to address it at the at the motivation level that there will there should never be a motivation to do something that betrays the company and uh, of course you must have all the physical stuff that makes it difficult to do but uh, you know the world has shown that uh, that people who are determined enough to do something will end up doing it and so it's a combination of your uh, your question is correct it's a combination of both both of you so the, uh, i can uh, if i can club two questions here carrying both iit and iim tags although it is a huge prestige in the country they also come with a lot of societal pressure here yes so how did you manage when you ventured into this new space that to in 80s and what role did your family play in that Uh, good question uh, you see for a very long time i was uh, effectively traumatized by the societal reaction to my desire to step away from uh, from a proper employment uh, it took me almost 10 years to come out of this uh, so called stigma of not working for a large uh, not working in a stable position in a large uh, and uh, well paying organization the things that kept me going were uh, family support i must say that both on my side and my wife's side they were fully supportive uh, I mean, not just financially i was living with my parents and so on so obviously there was a financial support element there but in terms of uh, the moral support they gave us the 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 feeling that you know you're doing what you're doing is good it will work out don't worry it doesn't matter and you know you go through uh, periods of depression when things have not worked out and people leave when you lose money on something and you need somebody to vent to you need somebody to support you and perhaps you would have a mentor to do that today you would have an eo forum to do that today but they didn't exist in those days so all you had to do was to fall back on immediate family i must say that they were extraordinarily supportive in those days and uh, refused to see me give up but in all honesty it was perhaps for a period of 5 years at the end of 5 years i could see a line of sight 
to at least remaining head above water, if not doing well. Until then, it was a question of whether we would survive or not. So that was a period when I needed help most, and that is when I got it most. I also must acknowledge that uh, uh, I had some, uh, you know, there are people of great eminence today, but they were very young in those days, people like Mr. Uday Kotak, Deepak Parekh, they were all my peers. I mean, they're all the Uday Kotak 62 or something. So he's my age. And we were all great friends. We used to work together and we used to chat about. He was in a different league. It's a different matter. But still, we were co-founders. We were founders together. These are the people we would share tales and we would uh, sort of uh, uh, keep each other's morale up and so on. So I must acknowledge a debt of gratitude to people like them as well. Yes. So the next follow-up question is, there is a difference between a founder and an investor as in a there's a dilemma of marrying to the idea of your own startup while being skeptical to an idea as an investor how do how do you manage to uh, carry on with this dilemma and what is your suggestion to the future entrepreneurs and investors alike so if i understand that correctly i am not a startup founder anymore uh, at best it's a large uh, well established established company basically running on its own and I have very little role on a day-to-day -day basis to play with that company at all. So I have uh, I have actually read, today it is usual for some founders to be investors as well, uh, current generation, but I was never a, found, never a founder and an investor in my, if I had money, I would invest in my own company, I had no money. But uh, the answer to your question is that as an investor, I look for a founder who is one, passionate about what he's doing and two, great at execution. I, as I said before, I think India lacks an execution. And uh, execution skills are still in this day and age at a premium. If I find that uh, that whatever is the idea is posed by the founder, first he should be passionate about it. He should not be doing it because he thinks that, you know, that is the flavor of the day and that he will get a series A if he's in that space, if he'll get a series B. If that is the sole motivation, then I'm a little skeptical about it. Uh, but if he's passionate about it, even if there's no series A, I figure that we will make it happen somehow. But so long as he's passionate about it and he's willing to make it happen. And two, he should be great at execution. I should see from his body language, I should see from his language that he's also keen on making it happen at the ground level and not just talking about it at a presentation level. If those two are there, then I am an investor. Otherwise, I'm a little skeptical. As we've all learned, the details of implementation are so key to having yes. entrepreneurial big ideas succeed. So there's one question from Siddharth. How do you ensure data secrecy from customers an employee having admin access can easily leak or sell data yeah. so how do we ensure that privacy yeah, so this sort of goes back to the earlier question that uh, that uh, i think uh, Professor Nag asked uh, it is the same thing in the large organization uh, at a certain level the people who have access uh, beyond beyond the normal they must be people who are your DNA. You know, I, I must say that if there are six, 7,000 employees in, in the company today, I cannot say that all of them are exactly as posing our DNA and so on, because it's just too large for us to ensure that. But certainly people in the leadership team, and you can define leadership in a slightly expanded way also, people in the leadership team certainly are part of the culture and part of the DNA, and many of them are of great vintage. They've been with the company for 15, 20, 30 years at times. And uh, we use them as the seeds to propagate the culture and DNA. It's not possible for one person to propagate culture and DNA. You need to have seeds of uh, a culture, which then go on to sort of expand themselves into the rest of the organization. And you need to set an example. You need to set an example by doing the right things. And you need, you need to set an example by punishing or really uh, taking severe action against anything that you ever discover was done out of the way. So it's a kind of course, there's always the technology, physical access being restricted with USB keys. So all the technological aspects are there. But as I've said, no amount of technology can stop a determined person from doing something wrong if that's what he wants to do. Only culture can prevent that from doing it. And so it's a combination of the two, like I said earlier. That was really interesting, sir. So I think we have almost covered the broad themes of the questions. That's I right. now invite Professor Balram Abitathur, the chairperson of CEI, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Nikhil. I'm fantastic, Mr. Shankar. I'm really proud as an IMC and of what you have achieved. Really great insights on what makes someone a successful entrepreneur. When the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation was brainstorming in the summer as to what activities we should focus in the coming years, what struck us was a great opportunity existed in recognizing and documenting the contributions made by our illustrious alumni in the space of entrepreneurship. 
the director not only backed our proposal but also gave us immense support at all levels from giving ideas to to herself involving a lot in with many of the operational things uh, which has resulted in this talk today she also came up with the idea of naming this webinar series as i am see i am create thank you professor said and when we approached mr shankar to give this talk he immediately agreed to be a speaker uh, thank you uh, very much mr shankar once again we plan to have more such events and wish to have a proper documentation of the sig significant contributions by our alumni to entrepreneurship and and innovations we are very grateful to so many of our alumni for making it to this talk today i i could even see, see quite some senior people out out there we are also grateful to our students and and colleagues for attending this talk uh, on behalf of the ce i am grateful to nikhil pramit the esl and the imcip for all the support uh, to the cei for this event it was a lot of fun working with all of you and uh, my request is uh, that please go visit our youtube channel uh, i am C i am create and uh, we will also be making announcements regularly so we plan to after today's event we are really uh, feeling gung ho to have more of these events and and really have a repository of of the various things our great alumni have done thank you and I thank, think you, Baldram. Thank, you, Baldram. thank you Baldram. the kind of learning that you get from folks like shankar and our other alumni will be so invaluable there is there is no substitute from for, for this kind of thing hearing it from somebody who's made the exactly. talk identified the issues resolved the problems and sometimes didn't resolve the problems because as we often hear we sometimes failure is the biggest teacher so we have folks on our show on this entrepreneurship channel that uh, will also talk about entrepreneurial adventures that did not work out because that's great learning as well so thank you all for your involvement in joining us today and helping us make this series is very vibrant. We look forward to doing lots more of them. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you, Professor Zit. Thank you, Professor Zit. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone, Take care. for joining us. Bye.